The readings are as written and in that order. The first reading is Psalm 82. God presides in the great assembly. He gives judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjust and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the cause of the weak and fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They know nothing. They understand nothing. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the Most High. But you will die like mere men. You will fail like every other ruler. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. The second reading. Further conflict over Jesus' claims. Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were there gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. But Jesus said to them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I've said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, what about the one whom the Father set apart has his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my father. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in the father. Again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. This ends the lesson. Thanks be to God.
Let's pray. Lord, give us ears to listen for your voice and, a, and wills set to follow you. Amen. I often get notifications on my iPhone from BBC Sport with snippets of news and views about Premier League football. Just the headline flashes onto the screen and I need to open the app to see the full message. Now recently, when I was preparing this, which was actually a few weeks ago, I saw an item saying, Newcastle need a miracle and Arsenal need Jesus. Intrigued, I read the full story which reported Alan Shearer's uh, predictions for the forthcoming season now well underway. In his view, it would be extraordinary if Newcastle were to repeat their achievements of last season. They'd need a miracle. And Arsenal would need their Brazilian striker, Gabriel Jesus, to be fully fit. Came off the bench, didn't he, yesterday? Nothing particularly spiritual about those remarks. And then, a couple of days later, I was in the supermarket, and I saw a man with a T-shirt bearing the words... I am not the Messiah. There was some small print underneath which I couldn't quite make out or felt I couldn't quite sort of creep up to him to get a closer view. <clears throat> well, actually, I hadn't noticed anything about him that uh, was uh, particularly sort of, you know, noteworthy uh, to indicate to me that he might be the Messiah, but perhaps it was helpful um, just to, you know, the T-shirt cleared up any possible doubt and confusion about the matter. The religious leaders of the Jewish people in Jerusalem were well aware that by his words and actions, Jesus had been making messianic claims. He'd healed a disabled man on the Sabbath and had defended his actions by saying that my father is always at work and I am working too, John chapter 5, verse 17. And they clearly understood that by calling God his own father, Jesus was making himself equal with God. And at the festival of tabernacles, just as the priests in the temple were solemnly pouring out water around the altar in thanksgiving, for God's blessing and in hope for the future, Jesus had been outside yelling at the top of his voice that anyone who was spiritually thirsty should come to him and believe in him. John 7, verses 37 and 38. He'd given sight to a man born blind and had accepted worship from him in chapter 9. He claimed to be the good shepherd, the one known and loved by the Father, chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. Some of the people had already decided for themselves that Jesus was the Messiah, but others had said he was demon-possessed and raving mad. Verse, 10 of our chapter, verse 20 of our chapter 10, from which Alex read. And now a group of these religious leaders ask Jesus the question, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Verse 24. And the opening verses of, of, of that passage uh, speak of uh, the fact that it was the festival of dedication. It was in winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple courts in Solomon's colonnade. This is the festival of Hanukkah, the Jewish holiday, which will be celebrated this year again between the 7th and the 15th of December. It commemorates the time in 164 BC when Judas Maccabeus liberated Jerusalem from the enemy hands and reconsecrated the temple, which had been desecrated by Antiochus IV. And consequently, Judas and his family became kings in the land. And even though they were not descendants of David, their dynasty lasted for a hundred years. So every time that the Jewish people 
celebrated Hanukkah, their thoughts turned not only to God and liberation and to thanksgiving for having their temple back, but also to kings and how they became kings. And now here's Jesus walking in the temple during this festival and talking about, as I think that you saw last week, we were away, about the good shepherd, the real shepherd, the king who would come and show all the others up as a bunch of thieves and brigands. Were these Jews now wondering whether, after all, Jesus might be the sort of Messiah that they would like to have, who would liberate Jerusalem from the hands of the enemy, restore the nation, and become Israel's true king? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly, they ask. Meaning, perhaps, are you our sort of Messiah? Well, of course, we know that Jesus was not merely claiming to be a national deliverer. By laying down his life and taking it up again, he would soon show himself to be the saviour of the world who would deliver all who would believe in him to be delivered from the power of sin and death. So Jesus answered them by saying in verse 25, I did tell you, but you do not believe. He'd been making huge claims, but they had not been willing to believe the evidence of the works, the miracles he had been doing in his father's name. They had closed minds. I've got a... Uh, yeah, there we go. <clears throat> and now Jesus continues by saying... You do not believe because you are not your, my sheep. Thank you, Tim, for giving us the introduction, setting our minds thinking about sheep. I'm not sure that the sheep here are necessarily as completely foolish as that one uh, going into the ditch, and certainly neither are they irrational. You do not believe because you are not my sheep. The sense of this may be um, rather than uh, that their unbelief was evidence that they weren't his sheep but it may be that rather not being his sheep um, was or rather that not being his sheep was the cause of their unbelief but the implication of Jesus's words is very clear the world is divided between those who believe in him and those who do not so then, who are the sheep who belong to Jesus? It's those who listen and those who follow. Verse 27. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. What is promised to the sheep of Jesus' flock? I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. How glorious is this? How spectacular. Those who hear the voice of Jesus and recognize it as the voice of their shepherd will be safe forever. He will look after them, and even death itself, the last great enemy, cannot ultimately harm them. But what is the guarantee for this wonderful security within the flock? It's this. I and the Father are one. My Father who has given the sheep to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The promise is founded 
on the unbreakable bond of love and union between Jesus and his father. The sheep that Jesus owns are the ones the father has given to him. Christian confidence about the future beyond death is not a matter of wishful thinking, a vague general hope, or a temperamental inclination that things will turn out right in the end. It's built firmly on nothing less than the union between God the Father and God the Son. Hearing Jesus say, I and the Father are one, was enough for his Jewish opponents to prepare to stone him, verse 31. Not, it appears, on account of any of the good works that Jesus had shown to everyone, but, in verse 33, as it says, for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus didn't deny that he'd said, I am God's son, verse 36, and was no doubt fully aware of the strong emotions aroused within his opponents, who considered such a claim to be deeply dishonoring to God. Incidentally, the mosque, which now stands today on the temple site in Jerusalem, has inscriptions around the inside of its dome, which include this. God is only one God, far be it removed from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. It's as if to say, is there not a unique creator, worthy of all praise, jealous of all rivals for his worship? Then how dare these Christians give worship to a carpenter's son? Despite the great danger he is in, Jesus responded with calm courage to his objectors by quoting from their own scriptures. In verse 34, he quotes from Psalm 82, verse 6, which Alex read to us. Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? In this psalm, the leaders of Israel, those who had delegated responsibilities from God, are themselves described as gods and sons of the Most High because, as Jesus suggests in verse 35, they were people to whom the word of God came. The psalm's clear that the leaders were meant to act justly, but they failed to do so. Nonetheless, implied Jesus, if even these people were called gods, how much more appropriate it was that he, who had a unique, a unique relationship with God and a unique mission from God, should be able to use the title Son of God without being accused of blasphemy. Don't believe me unless I do the works of my Father. But if I do them, even though you don't believe me, believe the works. That you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. They needed to open their minds to the astonishing truth that their Messiah King was God himself in the person of Jesus. There's much more that could be said about this verse 35. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture cannot be set aside, not least because of what it tells us about how Jesus regarded the Old Testament. And also, in my mind, because of how this relates to what John tells us in chapter 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Scripture cannot be set aside, and we cannot set Jesus aside, the Word made flesh. And we cannot know him in our lives unless we open our closed minds to trust in him. <clears throat> I 
However, I'm not going to dwell more upon that verse. That can be another day. But I would like to finish by sharing with you a modern parable, which I think can help us to understand better the unique relationship that Jesus, the Son of God, has with the Father, and the unique from the Father, and carried out in perfect obedience to the Father. I'm quoting from Tom Wright's book, John for Everyone. <clears throat> They found the music, a single manuscript copy, among the piles of unsorted paper the composer had left at the time of his death. It was clearly a piece for solo violin, but it looked, looked extraordinary, difficult, daring, probably unplayable. Above it was scrawled in his shaky hand to the City Guild of Violinists. The City Guild was honoured but embarrassed. None of them could play the piece. Copies were made and each member took one home to try it out. When they met later, they tried to pass it off with excuses. Surely the old man couldn't have meant you to play those notes simultaneously. His mind must have been wandering. Anyway, it seemed very strange. Not much tune to it. Though they couldn't deny there were interesting passages. All of them declared that they'd give it another try one day. Some even wondered aloud whether the old man hadn't meant it to be played at all. It was just a strange and impossible idea. And they all quietly forgot about it. Until, one day, many years later, there came to the city an old man with a long straggly beard and a battered violin case. He hardly looked like a real musician. A gypsy, people thought, or a travelling tradesman with a second line in music teaching. He took lodgings just by the main city square. Not long afterwards, rumours began to circulate of strange and beautiful music being heard after dark. Finally, some of the city guild gathered under the windows. There was no mistaking it. They were listening... They were listening to the music that had been dedicated to them. It was indeed almost unplayable. Almost, but not quite. He was playing it, making it dance and leap and swell and fall. It was wild and strange and headstrong and sweet. As it died away, some of the city guild burst into spontaneous applause but others were furious. That was our music, they said. He's not a member of, this, of our guild. What right has he got to come here and play it? Trying to make us look stupid. The window opened and the old man looked out. I'm his son, he said. He taught me to play the piece. And he made me a member of the guild before he died. He was its honorary president, you know. Rubbish, shouted the angry violinist in the square below. You've no business here. How dare you? The next morning, the violinist had gone. The music was never heard in the city again. In Jesus' day, some learned Jewish thinkers reckon that Psalm 82 was talking about the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. When God gave the law, it was like a master composer leaving a piece of music for the local musicians to play. Had they but known it, they were made noble, even divine, simply by receiving it. When the law arrived, mere possession of it exalted Israel to superhuman status. It was God's own word and will. However, though some Israelites struggled hard to keep the law, they failed dismally. They broke the law again and again. But the memory remained through Psalm 82 of what might have been. And now there arrives in town 
Someone who isn't even a member of the regular guild of law students, let alone the guild of official religious persons, and who begins to do things which cause people to make strange claims about him. It's as though he's playing the music for the first time. And they're horrified because they didn't know anyone could do it. And it had almost become an article of faith with them that nobody could do it. The implication is staggering. The union of humanity and divinity which had arrived in their midst the wild, strange, headstrong and sweet song of incarnation is not after all a bizarre or impossible thing. It's as though the composer knew all along that his son would one day come and play the music and that, if it were to be appreciated, others had first to try it and to fail. They wouldn't like it, but that too was would be part of the plan, part of the music. But amidst it all, the son would be saying to them, don't you see, the father is present in me and I in the father. Are we ready to look at Jesus, to consider his works, the signs that point to his true identity and with an open mind to draw the right conclusions for ourselves will we hear his voice believe him and follow him if so will not only enjoy the sure promise of eternal life, we'll also hear the music again.